Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'd like to uh, welcome uh, every and each one of you, brothers and sisters, and uh, elders and young uh, friends, uh, inshallah, to the, uh, this uh, session of the yearly Sira conference. Uh, before we get started, we're about to get started, inshallah ta'ala. A uh, few things, inshallah. First is if, uh, you know, invite everyone to join the main stage, inshallah ta'ala, and uh, attend with us here, bi So if people are still around and waiting for the event to start, it is now being started. The second thing is, uh, I'll, uh, inshallah ta'ala, call for all your help to make it, inshallah, a wonderful experience attending this event and to maximize the benefit from this event through your uh, questions, your interactions, your warmth, uh, uh, welcoming to our speakers, inshallah ta'ala. And also if you have young children who are not able to stay attentively within the, the course of this, uh, this sessions, please, we have actually programs, uh, babysitting and daycare pro uh, programs uh, right by the entrance. So inshallah ta'ala, please escort your children to the babysitting program. And we also have uh, moms and daddies room, mommies and daddies rooms, where you can attend the, the program while being with your ch children. Uh, let them play, inshallah ta'ala, in, uh, in uh, this dedicated rooms, inshallah. Uh, without further ado, inshallah ta'ala, we'll uh, start with the recitation of the Quran from Shaykh Nabil bin Allah. بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم واختار موسى قومه سبعين رجلا لميقاتنا فلما أخذتهم الرجفة قال رب لو شئت أهلكتهم من قبل وإياه تهلكنا بما فعل السفهاء منا إن هي إلا فتنتك تضل بها من تشاء وتهدي من تشاء أنت ولينا فاغفر لنا وارحمنا وأنت خير الغافرين واكتب لنا في هذه الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة إنا هدنا إليك قال عذابي أصيب به من شاء ورحمتي وسعت كل شيء فسأكتبها للذين يتقون ويؤتون الزكاة والذين هم بآياتنا يؤمنون الذين يتبعون الرسول النبي الأمي الذي يجدونه مكتوبا عندهم في التوراة والإنجيل يأمرهم يأمرهم بالمعروف وينهاهم عن المنكر ويحل لهم الطيبات ويحل لهم الطيبات ويحرم عليهم الخبائث ويضع عنهم إصرهم ويضع عنهم إصرهم ولغلال التي كانت عليهم 
فالذين آمنوا به وعزروه ونصروه واتبعوا النور الذي أنزل معه أولئك هم المفلحون قل يا أيها الناس إني رسول الله إليكم جميعا الذي له ملك السماوات والأرض لا إله إلا هو يحيي ويميت فآمنوا بالله ورسوله النبي الأمي الذي يؤمن بالله وكلماته الذي يؤمن بالله وكلماته واتبعوه لعلكم تهتدون صدق الله العظيم صدق الله العظيم وبلغ رسوله الكريم ونحن على ذلك شاهدون وبه مؤمنون جزاك الله خير شيخ Nabil, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you for this beautiful recitation. Uh, Insha'Allah ta'ala now, uh, we uh, uh, would like to uh, welcome, uh, Insha'Allah, Imam uh, Juban, uh, the Imam of this uh, Masjid of Masjid al-Rahmah, and the uh, President of the Shura, the Imam Shura uh, Council of Western State, uh, our dear and beloved Imam, to, uh, Insha'Allah, do an opening uh, talk before us, Insha'Allah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salam ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabi ajma'in. Amma ba'du. Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri. وَحْلُ لُقْدَةً مِنْ لِسَانِ يَفْقَهُ قَوْلِ The first I would like to say thank you very much for the committee, those who made this preparation. I know they really they work so hard. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward them. May Allah accept all their good deeds and their effort, inshallah. We would like to thank all the speakers who came from far away. And all of you here came from all the corners of Washington. May Allah bless your steps and may Allah reward you. And also, as Allah gathered us here today, may Allah gather us together, inshallah, in Jannah til Firdaus. Question What is the theme or the title of this Sierra conference? Anybody? No one? Yes. What? Huh? Mashallah, sister. You, I'll give you a gift, inshallah. <laughs> the confident Muslim. I, want, I would like to share a story about this confident Muslim. Abdullah bin Abi Quhafa, one day he met Amir al Mu'minin in the masjid. He said, Ya Amir al Mu'minin, I just came back from Persia and Rome, and I saw the rulers there, the king, the ministers, they, they wore wear the luxury clothes, very expensive shoes. And you should be more deserved than them. Because Islam is superpower also now. And Umar looked at him, you know Umar. He said, if they weren't you, I will stop your head. And then Umar said the following word. I want this word put in your mind, your heart. Maybe put the banner in your room. He said in Arabic, لَقَدَ أَزَّنَ اللَّهِ بِالْإِسْلَامِ وَإِذَا نَذَحَبْنَا نَبْتَغِي الْإِزَّةَ بِغَيْرِ الْإِسْلَامِ أَذَلَّنَ اللَّهِ Allah did honor us. Allah gave us respect. Uh, dignity through Islam. 
If we were seeking dignity, honor other than Islam, Allah will humiliate us. Subhanallah. So, in closing, inshallah, this is the opening of my word. To have a confidence is not easy. Need time, need an effort. If you look into the history of Rasulullah and his companion, how those people, they had a confidence. Three things, inshallah. Number one, what's the first revelation was revealed to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Iqra, read. So that means to have, in order to have confidence, you have to have knowledge. You have to educate yourself. When you know, when you know that Islam is a solution, Islam gives you everything, Islam is a package, way of life, you be proud as a Muslim. That's number one. Number two, what's the second revelation? Ya ayyuhal muddathir qum fa'andir Stand up and call people. That means practice from what you learn. And number three, in order to do all this, you need the fuel. And the fuel is building good relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the next surah was revealed, Ya ayyuhal muzzammil Kumil layla illa qalila I said kumil layla, wake up at night Subhanallah Three elements To build the confidence What's the first one? Knowledge Second one Practice what you learn What number three? Build good and strong connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala So inshallah all the speakers will elaborate All these three elements inshallah And the last one if you want really to be to get benefit from this zero conference, the Prophet said, Ta'allam husnal istima kama ta'allam husnal kalam. Learn how to be good listeners, like you learn how to be good speaker. So please, if you can turn off your cell phone and turn on your heart. Right? And pay attention, inshallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know. Uh, give us benefit from what we learned so not today and inshallah we be successful in this life and next life Jazakallah khair Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Jazakallah khair Imam Juban may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us all to inculcate these as uh, into actions and attributes within ourselves inshallah now, inshallah, uh, uh, Brother uh, Mahmoud Khadir, uh, the President of MAPS, will uh, address uh, with an introductory and opening address. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. First of all, on behalf of MAPS, I would like to thank each and every one of you who have gathered here on this weekend to really for one purpose and that is to learn whatever we can from the attributes of our beloved Prophet ﷺ. For MAPS, as far as MAPS is concerned, we have been doing this as our event since the beginning of MAPS, basically to embody ourselves that whatever actions we do, uh, whatever programs we drive, are really uh, looking at the examples of Prophet Sallallahu and may Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, you know, accept whatever uh, we are doing and what we are trying to do. Many of you may have come here for the first time uh, to Maps, so please take time to look around the programs and the facility that we have. Inshallah, you will benefit a lot. We are trying our best to make sure that we cater to the various needs that our community has, both from the child all the way to the adults. So please feel free to look at these different programs and then uh, you know leverage from that. Uh, and then I would like to welcome our great speakers uh, who we were successful and the team that we organized the CIRA conference really worked very, very hard. So please remember them in your duas because they care only about one thing that the acceptance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I request all of you to remember them, whoever has put this uh, conference together in your duas. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept their deeds. 
and I am very confident that all the speakers that we have lined up, uh, inshallah, will be very inspiring and it will be a great weekend that you would be spending here uh, amongst uh, all of us trying to learn whatever little we can from uh, the best example and the most confident example of a Muslim that we can think about that is our Prophet So uh, uh, without any much delay, uh, you know, I would ask uh, uh, Brother Ilyasi to get the program started. I just came here to thank you all, to uh, wish you the, all the best for the next two days and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept your presence here as well as you know whatever the learnings that we can do uh, from here and please remember maps in your duas and uh, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help guide us so that we can do whatever we do at maps is uh, satisfying to him and following the sunnah of our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and also remember to support us in all the activities and uh, in whichever way you can so uh, <coughs> Uh, so with that, I will give it to Brother Ilyas. Jazakumullah khair. Jazakumullah khair, Brother uh, Mahmoud. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and bless all the uh, leadership of this masjid for organizing such uh, wonderful events. Inshallah ta'ala, I'm very excited that we're getting started being Allah Azza wa Jal. It is a truly blessed day, the day of Jum'ah, in a truly blessed month, the month of Rajab. Only few days, only counted number of days to Ramadan bi and you're all here to pump up that Iman inshallah and get ready for Ramadan and inshallah ta'ala get strengthen our bonds with our Lord through strengthening our bonds with each other as a community through being, manifesting, being that uh, confident Muslim inshallah ta'ala. I ask Allah Azza wa Jalla to reward you all for this time you are here. Inshallah to multiply, multifold your hasanat and I invite myself and every one of you to think of tons of tons of good intentions and inshallah renew our intentions to be all to uh, harvest all of that goodness in us inshallah ta'ala. Now, um, I'm very excited to invite to the stage uh, the very first, our very first speaker. Uh, our first, very first speaker, uh, Ustada Tahira Ahmed. Uh, she is a dynamic scholar practitioner who was raised in Morton Grove 3 and graduated from Niles West High School, where she played varsity basketball. Ahmed, Sister Ahmed, uh, studied classical Arabic and traditional Islamic sciences at Al Diwan and Al Azhar in Cairo, in Egypt, in department and in the Department of Islamic Studies and Christian Muslim Relations and Islamic Chaplaincy at Harford Theological Seminary in Connecticut. During Women's History Month 2014, Chaplain Ahmed was honored at the White House as the leading Muslim female in the United States and recognized among top 10 good Muslim stories of 2013. MashaAllah, such a manifestation of a successful, confident Muslim. May Allah Ta'ala bless her and bless uh, all of us, inshallah, to follow those four steps. Without further ado, Sister Tahir Ahmed, inshallah. So I heard this community is really vibrant and really amazing. So I'm going to say Assalamu Alaikum again, not the Isna style where I'll say it three or four times. I'm going to say it one more time again, inshallah, and I want to receive you know, the barakah from all of you. So Assalamu Alaikum. MashaAllah. So Jazakallahu Khairan for coming out this evening. I have been really excited about speaking at this particular masjid because all of my friends who live out in the West Coast have said such amazing, amazing things, mashallah, about this place that you know it's really grown into such an amazing community. And so alhamdulillah, I think Abdurrahman's also spoke with you all before. So it's really a pleasure, alhamdulillah, to be here today and to see so many young people, especially in the audience, as well as older adults, um, as, as well as mashallah little ones running around and doing fun things inside the masjid. So I wanted to address this topic from a more personal perspective because in the way in which this topic has affected my personal life as an American Muslim woman, 
I think it's very important for you to understand my own journey in trying to understand how do I play a role as an American Muslim woman living in the 21st century in post-modernity while trying to remain true to my faith values and still find relevancy at the intersectionality of you know, being Muslim and then still contributing to society. So I wanted to start off really by going into who I am as a person because many of you, maybe this is the first time you've heard me speak. So I wanted to actually start by talking a little bit about how when September 11th occurred, how for myself and even for my own community that we were going through a very difficult time in trying to explain what Islam was and how it was very different from what many people were viewing it. And so this whole idea of what this topic is about today, of trying to re reaffirm our identity, but also having to always in some ways defend our religion was something that was very real to me when I was growing up. So I want to start off actually by giving you a little bit of background of who I am. Abdurrahman actually is from Chicago, so um, he, you actually may know this story, I'm not sure. So my name is Tahir Ahmed. I'm currently the Director of Interfaith Engagement and Associate Chaplain at Northwestern University in Evanston. Uh, we have three campuses, one in Chicago downtown, one in Evanston, Illinois, and now we have one, alhamdulillah, in Doha, so which I just got to visit, which was absolutely amazing, alhamdulillah. My journey though all to where I am today is quite interesting and I think sharing that with you will give you a better understanding of the decisions that I made and the trajectory that I chose bi idhnillah. So I grew up in Morton Grove, which is a suburb right outside of Chicago. My parents came to the United States. My father came from India. Um, he is third generation Yemeni and Iraqi and my mom's grandfather was actually a Turk who lived in Hyderabad and many of you know Hyderabad was under the Ottoman rule as you know the Nizam who was considered one of the seven richest men to have ever lived. All the Hyderabadis in here, can you raise your hand? All right, yeah, Hyderabadis love Hyderabad. I, that's one thing you know that you'll know about them and the sister smiling and saying yes I do. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. So, and there was a reason for that because the Nizam basically was a Muslim and if you study the historic period that he lived in, he actually guaranteed a lot of Muslims the kind of health system that we actually put, well, would probably dream of today. In any case, that's a side note. So, um, my parents are actually quite mixed. We found this out because my cousin did her dissertation on Qaja Moinuddin Chisti, who happens to be our great, 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 great ancestor. I'd like to be linked to the Sufi master. My parents came to this country and my father was wanting to do finish his residency and my mother was also finishing her education, alhamdulillah. They, start, they decided to stay in the United States because they believed that this would be a great place to raise their family. So, my father sent us to an Islamic school. How many of you actually go to a full-time Islamic school here? Or have been to one? Very few, wow, subhanAllah. Abdurrahman, you went to a full-time Islamic school? No? Kind of, okay, kind of. So we grew up going to an Islamic school. Now, I'm sharing that because in some ways one could argue that I was indoctrinated to the faith tradition. I wore the hijab because all the other girls in my school wore hijab. I prayed, you know, alhamdulillah five times a day because everybody else prayed five times a day. I fasted in Ramadan, alhamdulillah, because everybody else fasted in Ramadan. So in some ways you could argue that I was in, in some ways I was indoctrinated to the faith tradition, right? What that would mean is I'm just doing it because everybody else is doing it. When it came time to graduate from grade eight, I begged my parents to send me to a public school. And the arguments were, you know, I don't want to just get to know like Khadija and Aisha and Omar and Saleh. I want to get to know Stacy and Kim and Jacob and Jason. Well, maybe not Jacob and Jason. I don't know if dad would allow that. You can laugh. So Alhamdulillah, um, my parents agreed. So they sent me to Niles West High School, which at the time, by the way, was considered by the state of Illinois as one of the most diverse high schools in the, in the, in the region. Now what that also meant is imagine walking into this high school, literally it was like out of a movie scene. You walked in into the cafeteria and you had you know, the jocks on one side, the cheerleaders on one side, what they call the goths on another side. And I'm not trying to stereotype here, but you know, those were the kind of cliques that I'm just trying to paint a picture for you. So where did I fit in into all of this, right? In this social milieu, like where do I fit in? I'm the only other muhajiba in the entire school, 4,000 students. I remember walking in and thinking, okay, where do I go, where do I sit, what do I do? So I decided that as the brother mentioned, I played varsity basketball, I'm not that tall, I'm only like 5'5 five, five and almost 5'6, five, right? So I played varsity basketball, I was a point guard. 
Um, the Northwestern student male body says I'm 83% better than the men, which they took a stat. I know they're Northwestern students. Um, it's a true stat, by the way. So I played varsity basketball, I ran track, and I played volleyball. And I thought that if I did these things, I would really fit into kind of that, you know, what everybody really respected, sportive events and athletes. So and alhamdulillah, I felt like I was organically part of the social kind of structure there because people knew I was different. They didn't ask me anything about my faith. They never said, oh, why do you wear the hijab? Or, you know, who are you? They just kind of thought it was a cool thing. Oh yeah, she's that, you know, they called me the ninjabi. Um, they gave me air high fives, they knew they couldn't touch me, so you know, my, basically even my coach would give me air high fives and people would always say like, oh that's so cool, like who is she, what is that, right? All of it was really neat and really cool until September 11th occurred. Now, I have a lot of things to share around September 11th because I think it's very pertinent to this topic and the way in which Muslims started to feel like they had to constantly defend their faith um, for something that a fringe, Muslim, a, you know, fringe population of the Muslim community believes and has enacted upon. So, I basically will share two, part, two stories that I think are very relevant um, to what we're talking about today. One is, some of you who've heard me speak before know this story. The same referee who had seen me play basketball for the last three years in the Central Suburban League, so this is the same person, right, who's seen me play, stops the game at a minute 34 seconds left into the clock. A minute 34 seconds left into the fourth quarter and says, number 33, you're in violation of the IHSA, Illinois Rules for Uniform Code and Conduct, meaning the hijab and like the sweats that I was wearing, because you know, I wouldn't wear shorts, I would wear like long pants and long, long you know, uh, shirt inside. Every single day for the last three years when I would get on the basketball court, that would be my, the greatest fear I had. I was so nervous before every game. The greatest fear, and anyone who's a hijabi and who plays team sports knows this, it was like always this fear that subhanAllah one day the game's gonna stop and everyone's gonna look at me. And this was that moment. So the game stops. I see, I, I was asked to go on the sideline. I drop the ball, I go to the sideline. My coach comes out and he's arguing with the ref, he was a hothead, and they were both arguing back and forth. And I heard words like bigotry, and I heard him say, not in this game, not on my court, I know why you're doing this, I'm not gonna let it happen. And alhamdulillah, I was let back into the game. We were already leading, so it didn't matter, right? At the end, after you do the sportsmanship handshake, I was walking back to the locker room. And as I was walking back to the locker room, one of the parents came down from like the fourth bleacher. I still remember, he walked towards me and then he said, number 33. I turned towards him and he said, it's a shame they let you back in. It's a shame they let you back in. So I walked to the locker room, I walked inside. It was super silent, everybody was very, very quiet. They were all like, oh, okay, she's here. Got to the corner. I wanted to hear something from someone, like some, anything, like, are you okay? So why do you wear that? What is that called? Nothing. Everyone was just really, really silent. And I noticed that the silence continued. I remember walking into the hallway, everybody, you know, it was like this, like Musa Ali Salam with a staff, like everything split. Like everybody just went back, you know, to their locker room. Literally out of like a movie scene. No one asked, right? And part of me felt like if somebody would just ask me, if somebody would just say something, and then some people started saying things, but it wasn't what I expected, right? So I got, uh, there's so much to say, but in terms of time, I don't have time to tell you. But I got spat on, I got pushed around. Um, really, it was, it was very horrible, and so I got very, very depressed. And then one day, my honors English teacher asked me to stay after class. And so I sat down, and he came over and he said, Tahra, I just want you to know that if you need to talk to someone, I'm here for you. And I thought, alhamdulillah, that's like, finally somebody's saying something, you know, this is wonderful. And then he said, Tahra, if your father makes you wear that at home, or when you leave your home, you can come talk to me, you can come talk to our social workers, counselors, you don't have to do that if you don't want to. So I, I paused, I remember asking him, why do you feel that way? So he went back to his desk, and he took a sheet of paper, and he came back, and he slipped it in front of me. 
And it was this image, some of you who are you know, a little bit older around September 11th and weren't like in second grade, because a lot of you are in college right now, so you're probably around in second grade, third grade around that time. Those of you who remember this image, I, I actually looked up, um, Northwestern's media um, does research on images. So we looked up how many times was this image um, circulated in, in mainstream media. It was 183 times between 2001 and 2000. Uh, sorry, 2001 and 2003. So basically this image was circulated a lot. Do you remember the image of a man from the Taliban holding a long stick over a bunch of women wearing blue burqas? Yeah, I see head nods. Okay, this was the image he slipped in front of me, right? And he's asking me, imagine I'm like 16, 17 years old. He's genuinely concerned about me. He's saying, look, I, you can come talk to me. You know, you can, you know, I'm here for you. But at the same time, He's positioning me in a place where now I have to tell him, by the way, I don't wear this because my father beats me at home or forces me to wear it. And by the way, I am not associated with the people that you are seeing images of every single day post 9-11, right? Like I'm basically placed in a corner in a really strange way, which is I'm here for you, I care for you, but guess what? Who are you people? And how are you any different from what I'm seeing every single day? That is a reality that a lot of Muslims face, especially the ones who were in high school and in college right around September 11th. And I'm just one very small example of that. I'm sure Abdurrahman has his own stories to share with you and, and whatnot. But the reason I'm sharing the story with you is because in that moment, I had to decide like, SubhanAllah, what do I do now? All I could say as a 16, 17 year old was, thank you for your concern, thank you. And I walked out. And I remember walking out thinking to myself like, SubhanAllah, the world is asking questions and I need some answers quick, like fast. Then a few days later, I started to realize like, you know what? It's not just the questions of other people that I have to answer. I started having my own questions. Like another teacher basically, who was a sociology teacher that I took a special class for honors. We had like a special program, it's called the Scholars Program. She basically put Surat Nisa at 34 right in front of my face and was like, so do you want to do a research paper on this? Any of you know what, the, what I'm talking about? Basically, she's asking me to write a paper on Wadri Buhunna, okay? And she's asking me basically to explain that for her class, right? And I'm like 17 years old. I realized, all right, I need to figure out what some of these answers are for myself. So that basically put me on my own journey towards learning Islam. And so I went to a private Muslim seminary, and then I went to Hartford Seminary, and then went to Egypt, and so other parts of the Muslim world. And my own journey and, and my trying to understand Islam for my own self. But one thing that I learned in that process was that while there were people who were constantly asking questions and sometimes very aggressive, there were some people, alhamdulillah, that were really actually very caring and very respectful. And I'll give you an example of that. One day, basically, in my honors gym class, so sorry, I keep saying I was an honors this and that. Yeah, alhamdulillah, that's how we roll. Um, so in my gym class, we had something called Leaders Gym. And it turned out that they had a plan, some of the students had a plan to basically tear off my hijab during the class. So as they were about to do that, I had three, basically three non-Muslim men, and the two Muslim men decided to walk away, by the way. Mo and someone else, but you know, I'm not sharing their names. But basically, the three men st stood around me and protected me, and were like, you can't touch her, right? SubhanAllah, it was the, the most powerful experience that I've had. So I, re I remember that, you know what, there were people who were just very rude and very uh, aggressive, but then there were those who stood up for me. My Jewish boss, after I basically worked in a pharmacy, and when I went one day, when uh, a lady came to take her medication, I was actually usually working in the back filling pills, but that day I was working the register. She came to get her medication, and when I was giving it to her, she leaned over me and she said, Mark, I am not taking my pills from a red-headed Muslim girl. So I remember just leaving the bag there and walking to the back of the pharmacy. My boss came out. I didn't see him. He just went right to the window. I heard him say, no, 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 thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
I asked my colleagues later like what happened because I didn't see the interaction. They told me that he told her because he was a retail pharmacist, which means you know he built his career by business, the business of individuals over time. He told her, thank you for your business for the last 16 years. Thank you, thank you again and again. But if you're gonna behave like that, you're basically, thank you for coming here, thank you for your patronship. So he basically put his, you know, uh, what we call like uh, money where his mouth is, so to speak. So he actually invited me uh, for a Shabbat meal afterwards and he said, you know, Tahra, the greatest thing that Muslims can do in this country is start building alliances with people and show them what your religion is really about. So I realized, okay, so this Jewish man is telling me something that they've tried to do in this, in this country. And he said, you know, the one thing that we have been unsuccessful at, and this is his perspective, okay, one perspective. He said, we built our community very, very strong, but we really don't know a lot about other people. So as you know, Pew Research suggests that the Jewish community in the United States is actually uh, the, the most well-educated community, as well as, you know, they're doing really, really well in terms of the kind of struct social, social structures that they built for their own community. The Muslims are actually second to the Jewish community in this country. But what he's also saying, right, and what he's trying to express to me is, get to learn more about other people and build those alliances. And that got me to think, subhanAllah, I started talking to one of my teachers and he said, you know, if people knew just one hadith of the Prophet wasallam, in how they're contributing and reacting to the kind of defense that people put against us, that's all they need to know. And I said, well, what is that? And he said, you know, when the Prophet wasallam go goes into Medina, what does he tell people? What does he say to people? Does anyone know? What is kind of like the, the, the one basic advice that he gives to people? Anyone? He says, Afshu salam. Afshu salam. What does that mean? Okay. But salam is not just peace, right? We'll talk about uh, the different understandings on that in a second. Afshu salam wa al ta'am. What does that mean? There's a lot of Arabs in this house, so y'all need to like, <laughs> assuming that you know the, the answer, right? وَأَطْعِمْ الطَّعَامْ Like few people. وَصِلُ الْأَرْحَامْ وَصَلُّوا بِالْلَيْلِ وَالنَّاسُ مَنَامْ Right? So the four things. The four things he said, my, one of my teachers said, you know, subhanAllah, if these four things people started doing, that's all they need, right? So the first thing the Prophet says is spread peace. But it's not just like saying, oh, assalamu alaikum to people, right? In order to say salam, you need to actually expect the response, right? What's amazing is, I was, when I was look, doing research on this, one of our imma basically said, in order to say salam to someone, what do you need and what do you have to expect? Can you just say salam and leave? No, a salam always receives a response. And so what this is saying is you need to be a person that's oriented towards people, right? You have to be present. In order to say a salam, you have to be fully present. And what the Imam uh, Jawban, what he said about listening, right? Listening actually is a very um, big part, right? It's a fundamental part of saying salam to someone. You have to be ready for the, the response for that. So what does that mean? You have to orient yourself in a community in a way where you're not just you know, in, engaging at the level of, okay, doing whatever you need to do and leaving. You actually have to be fully present and listening, right? So Sufyan ibn Awan, he said, rahimahullah, he said that listening actually requires three parts, or even the, the beginning of knowledge starts with listening. And the first type of listening is with the ear. The second type of listening is actually tadabbur. It's real intellect, real thinking. It's engaging with a community at the level of understanding them intellectually, understanding what their problems are, understanding who they are. So assalamu alaikum isn't limited to just saying, hey, I'm here, I'm gonna smile in front of you. It's engaging at the level of deep thought and, and understanding who's present before you, right? Understanding what is this environment that I'm working in? Who are these people around me? And listening at the level of of the ear and then basically tadabbur which is really understanding intellectually and then finally it's of the heart 
which means that if you are truly engaged within your community, it will affect the, the change that you bring will actually affect the community, inshallah, towards the positive. The next thing the Prophet says, and I'm going to close with this hadith, is right? It's basically if you're living in a society where the socioeconomic structure is consistently causing the weakest of members of society problems, then you cannot claim that you are in that society and creating positive change. The, for example, the Prophet ﷺ, when the message of Islam comes into the you know, pre-Islamic Arabian society, I basically in many of my lectures argue that Islam, while it was a you know, theological you know, um, entity that changed the existing theological framework, I often argue that actually it was a social justice movement. Why? Because if you look at what the Prophet was actually trying to fight in his own time and space, he was devastated because his own family was part of a tribal system that sought benefit from the weakest members of society. Why? All these different pagan Arab tribes would come into Mecca and do what? They would pay homage to the many different idols. And when they did that, they would, for example, you wanted a son, nobody wanted a daughter, right? You wanted a son, you paid off an idol, right? And then the gain, the, who was gaining the money from that? Basically the high and the mighty, right? It was a, it was a hierarchy. The Prophet ﷺ would retreat for many days because he was devastated in the way that his own community was dealing with the weakest members of society. That included women, that included slaves, that included, you know, even children. So the Prophet ﷺ understood that what was happening was wrong, but he really didn't do much about it, right? Until Allah Ta'ala forced him to go back out of his retreat, right? He's going into this retreat, but Allah Ta'ala forces him back out into his society and says, what the Shaykh just told us, Qum right? You have to go up and you have to, like, you have to go against these people. But why am I mentioning this? Because the Prophet ﷺ understood that in order to rebuild his society, you have to care for the weakest members. This is why Karen Armstrong, even like a non-Muslim scholar, argues that the reason Islam was so dynamic and revolutionary for, it, for its own time was not because it presented people with the one message of Allah. Why? Did the pagan Arabs not believe in one God? Did the pagan Arabs not believe in one God? Did they or did they not? They did. So why does the Qur'an in its Meccan period over and over and over again bring about the message of Tawheed? Just oneness of God, oneness of God, oneness of God. Why? Yes. Yes, thank you. The message of Islam is not just like, okay, this theological thing that changed people at, you know, uh, in terms of what they, um, in terms of like scripture, right? The message of Islam was actually going to dismantle the exploitative socioeconomic hierarchical structure that existed at the time, right? That's why it was so powerful. So when the Prophet ﷺ says, he's basically saying, revive your community, revive your socioeconomics. That's why Islam was such a powerful entity. Karen Armstrong and other historians and theologians argue that if the Prophet ﷺ continued to just say, you know, worship, worship one God, it wasn't because the people didn't believe in one God. It was because it was going to force them to dismantle the way in which you know they were gaining support from people was through these many idols right so afsh salam getting to know people getting to listen to people understanding people then feeding them doesn't necessarily just mean giving them food it actually is supporting a socioeconomic structure that helps alleviate people right and then he says wasal al arham reform basically all of the kind of uh, relationships that you have. I think Muslims in this country, we, get, we are really going through a very difficult period, especially post 9-11 and even now. But Alhamdulillah, we're in a much better place than we were at 9-11. One thing though, that I think we, as we're trying to progress, one thing that I think we have to really take deep, um, you know, the, put deep thought in and try to understand is, the level at which we are engaging in society is you know, very important, but our own relationships and our own personal lives, like when Isna did their last statistic, they found out that 48% of Muslim marriages are actually going through divorce. I'm not saying divorce is a bad thing. In fact, it is halal and it is something Allah Ta'ala has permitted it. Permitted, but 
you know, something like 40% of a divorce rate within a Muslim community tells you something about what's actually happening. It may suggest that as a community, we need to start looking at, okay, do we go through pre premarital counseling? Do we not? Do we actually have a systematic way of dealing with some of this? Do we have mental health training for people who are going through these situations? Not just marriage, I'm referring to the kind of larger, uh, you know, construct of how we need to address mental health issues in our community. And I'm saying that obviously as a mental health professional standing before you, because this is something that I do for for a living. So wasil <coughs> al-arham is something that may seem like, oh, just get, you know, get, have good relationships with people. But it's very, very important and very, very um, deeply related to the way a society functions. And the Prophet ﷺ was so wise when he said this. You know, he said, after he says, you know, you know, say salam, get to know each other, feed people, make sure your socioeconomic structure is, you know, powerful. Then he's saying, figure it out. Figure out your in internal relationships because that's ultimately going to really, you know, represent the way in which we continue um, to live in this country. The modern Jewish Orthodox community is paying a lot of attention to the way in which their relationships work. Stephen Cohen, who is a modern Jewish Orthodox, uh, uh, he takes stats on the way in which uh, that, that community, and I'm comparing us to the modern Jewish Orthodox community because I think we're the most, probably the most similar to them um, in terms of many other aspects of Muslim life. But they're taking very, very careful looks at, taking a very careful look at how the, um, their younger generation is dealing with a lot of challenges and then looking at how do, for example, women, what are the challenges women are facing? And they're putting a lot of money into figuring out how do we support all of the difficult challenges that are, their communities are going through. So I think this, it's a community that we can really learn from. And finally, the last thing I wanna say is when the Prophet says, you know, pray at night, really when no one else can see you. I think that's really powerful because as we're trying to really respond to how do we you know um, contribute to the pluralistic society you know the title of this talk a lot of us i think are involved in many different social justice and activist type of, you know um you know areas but i think one thing that i try to remind myself of over and over again is all of that requires a spiritual reservoir that we have to pull from a place of deep spiritual connection with Allah Ta'ala in order to serve whoever it is that we're serving, whether it's the Muslim community, whether it's your interfaith activism, whether it's you know at your job you're really involved in trying to you know contribute in that way, whatever field that you're looking into or in however you contribute to society, the Prophet taught us that at the end of the day, when you are alone and when you are completely by yourself, you are in sujood and that is ultimately the place where you get re-energized. And that is the place where you actually seek spiritual motivation. So no matter what challenges that you face, you and your, basically in your, in your deep commitment and submission to Allah Ta'ala, you're able to seek that you know, reju rejuvenation and that battery power, so to speak. So I think that hadith in itself is very powerful. It's something that teaches us that even as a community, when we are under attack and we're constantly you know, on, on basically defense, we're able to say, you know what? Our religion, alhamdulillah, is absolutely beautiful. This is how it's taught us to contribute to society. I think the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ that I shared with you is a very good example of how the Prophet ﷺ basically built by some historians one of the most unique communities. If you remember, many historians actually state that the uh, covenant of Medina was the first interfaith covenant known to humanity, basically, where he is actually makes an agreement with the pagan and the Jewish and the Christian and the Muslim community that was living there. And in fact, even till now, if you look at how the Muslim community has grown around the world, it is really by whenever we were put under attack, it was by persevering through that continuing to, to get to know people, you know, like over and over again. I think that's what we're here for. So inshallah, I hope I said something that was meaningful to you, something simple that you can take home with you. Um, and jazakallah khair for letting me share my story. I think Maghrib is soon, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop there. That's okay. Assalamu alaikum. Jazakallah khair, Rasulullah May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and reward you. This was really, really, really amazing speech. Alhamdulillah. 
I think you all are getting a taste of what we are about to experience, inshallah, on these two beautiful, wonderful days, inshallah. I hope you're all excited about what's going to come, inshallah, ta'ala, and all the great wisdom and uh, list, uh, um, knowledge that we're going to all learn and share, inshallah, ta'ala, and I hope, and I hope we're all, inshallah, going to end up very, 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 inshallah, proud of our faith and better Muslims, inshallah. We're going to break for salat, and please uh, request your help to join back your seats as soon as, inshallah, the sunnah prayer uh, finished. We want to start right after the salat, because we have two great other speeches about to come, inshallah, ta'ala. So please, as soon as uh, Maghrib is over and you do your sunnah, please join your seats, inshallah. Jazakumullah khair.